try to come back or share your screen. Yes, Nas, how are you? Hello. Hey, Maggie. I'm great, thank you. Thanks for having me here today. Yeah, thanks for being with us. And it's a really important topic, monetizing data. A lot of uh, people have said a lot of things about it, uh, some lies and some uh, realities, <laughs> uh, some realities, and I, we hope you will help us to uh, and guide us through uh, to this uh, uh, and how to monetize directly or indirectly making uh, data-driven decision, right? So that's uh, that's the idea. Are you able to share the, your screen with us? I will try, and I'll also try to give the topic justice. I think you've, you've set the stage quite well. Uh, can you see yeah. my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen uh, directly. Uh, yes. Excellent. Screen. That's In perfect that case, for, for 25 minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mehdi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Naz Radev, and I'm the co-founder and CEO at Infinite Lambda. Um, I'm here on invitation by Fivetran, who is one of the gold sponsors of this event. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about how we use integrated analytics to increase revenue through data-driven decision-making. So Infinite Lambda, uh, we consist of around 70 engineers. We specialize in um, building integrated analytics platforms um, that help our clients run their business in a more data-driven way. So thus far, we have built over 20 complete data platforms. And we have also been doing a number of training engagements where we help clients create and execute on a robust data strategy. And everything we do is tied to a demonstrable ROI, so return on investment. Um, and I have put down some numbers just to give you an indication of why we are useful. Um, so as I mentioned, we're here because of an invitation by Fivetran with whom we've been building a few platforms recently. In fact, they have enabled us to build um, two data platforms per month by automating the data engineering side of things. Um, so we can focus more on the uh, more important value add activities, uh, I would say, such as uh, advanced analytics and data science. And I want to explain more about how, how this works uh, later on. Because firstly, I want to just show you what I'll cover in my short talk today. Uh, I'll explain how we use data integrated, uh, sorry, integrated data analytics to increase revenue uh, for our clients, and specifically in the context of our fintech clients. Uh, I'll then also uh, touch upon, uh, given that this is an API conference, I want to highlight how APIs enable us to execute at speed and how a good API development lifecycle sets us up for success. Um, and finally, I will talk a little bit about um, Fivetran itself and how it fits in the process of building an entire data analytics platform, although you can hear a lot more about Fivetran on one of their uh, dedicated talks later on. Um, so how do we use integrated analytics to increase revenue? That's the big question, right? Um, your average fintech has access to a ton of marketing, sales, customer activity data, and a bunch of other types of data. And much of it is stored in uh, third-party services, such as uh, you have your Google Ads or various uh, social media ads platform uh, platforms. Um, then you have your various customer engagement tools like uh, Zendesk and MailChimp. You also have various things like uh, subscriptions uh, managing and CRM platforms such as the app stores, uh, Google Play, et cetera, if, if you're running an app or you know Salesforce if you're more kind of B2B. Um, uh, and, and there's obviously various application logs. So mixed panel is just one of many. You might be processing these internally. You might have something like Snowplow, Google Analytics, et cetera, et cetera. These are the things that tell you what your customers are doing with your product. Um, and almost certainly you have a first party system, for example, to call your transaction ledger, maybe customer databases, et cetera, et cetera. And that is probably stored on some database, maybe in the cloud or not. Um, so before we can integrate this data and do analytics on it holistically, uh, we need to bring it all together. And um, effectively, we need to arrive at something like this. Um, so I will come back to how we get there in a moment. Uh, but first, I want to explain explain uh, why we need it. So here's a simple pattern that we apply time and again. Um, we identify the customer segment A that makes the business the highest amount of revenue, um, sort of like the gold standard customer. I'll explain kind of how we do it in a minute. Um, but importantly, we then need to identify the customer segment B that is closest to it. So we identify these two segments using a mixture of advanced analytics and data science models that give us feature sets. Uh, so these are things that characterize each customer segment uh, relatively kind of you know, in, in, in a decent degree of detail. 
so we describe what each group of customers will do um, from how they are using the product to how they respond to marketing campaigns and in-app notifications. And even with, because we do attribution, we also uh, do things like which Facebook or Google ads they, they clicked on to get to our product in the first place. So if you notice here, there's a little star in the middle. So this indicates uh, a, a kind of identifying um, uh, a, a very clear uh, uh, kind of feature, a, a very um, uh, uh, or a set of features that we understand to make these two groups, these two segments different. And once we have identified this, um, we sort of approach the, the customers in, uh, in segment B with various uh, nudges. So we try to identify the best nudge to, uh, to apply on segment B. That might be um, you know, in-app messages, it might be email campaigns and so on, and try to nudge them to be more like A. So by nudging them to adopt the behavior that group A demonstrated, we evolve uh, group B customers to be more like um, group A. OK, so uh, this effectively is one iteration. At the end of this iteration, we hope to have, at least for some of the segment B customers, to have effectively made them to be more like group A. So they, they're now also belong to the gold standard, the highest revenue generating customers. And to illustrate with some examples now, um, uh, one of our clients is a UK-based fintech, um, a digital bank. They make revenue when their customers put money into their savings account. So we need our customers to save at least 250 pounds a month uh, using our product so we can make a profit. Uh, one segment consistently hits the mark. This is our segment A from the previous slide. Or in this case, we call it Jake because we like to create a name of persona um, that corresponds to a particular segment that our algorithms defined. Um, so you can see here, we've, we've put the three notable uh, product features that Jake uses, and these include um, a monthly top-up of around 150 pounds uh, each month, um, card transaction roundups, and uh, the so-called if this, then that rules that are quite specific to this particular um, client of ours that are rules you can set up on the app to automatically put money into your savings account from your current account um, if something special happens. So for example, you can set it to always put two pounds into your savings account if Donald Trump tweets. And so then we identify Segment B, uh, in this case, we call them mic. So the mics of our product uh, always use, uh, or, or similarly, they use uh, monthly top-ups and transaction roundups, uh, kind of in a similar manner and quantities uh, to Jake, but they don't use IFTTTs. So that's what makes them different. That's the kind of star uh, feature that we need them to adopt if they're going to look more like group A, aka the Jakes. Um, so how do we, how do we nudge? Mike to be more like Jake? Uh, well, clearly there is a feature, uh, that's the FTTTs. So an obvious nudge would be uh, send an in-app notification or an email message uh, nudging the mic to try FTTTs. Uh, in this example, we use integrate analytics to identify the best personalized strategy for a segment of customers, right? So what is, what is special here is that we don't just send a blanket nudge to everyone. We don't just send to everyone try FTTTs, right? And we don't randomly pick the feature we want to promote. Like we don't just say everyone use roundups. Um, instead, we use integrated analytics to be very specific in our targeting. And so we've identified that this consistently leads to improved outcomes because you target the right customers with the right message. Um, another example is uh, where we need to nudge customers on every step of their engagement with the product using uh, a best next action recommendation engine. So here we use data to identify, again, our gold standard customers like before, and to understand what they do. So what are the features and content they consume on this particular app before they sign up for the premium side of our product? So the, the, there's a freemium and there's a premium. Um, unlike uh, the simpler segmentation earlier, this one has a more of a temporal nature. So at each time T, there is a next best action at T plus one that gets you closer to becoming a premium member. And there's obviously a not so uh, great action that they can take that does not take them closer to a premium member. So effectively, we train our engine to recommend the action that gets the customer closer to the target at each step. So if segment B is customers who haven't yet signed up for premium, our objective is very clear. We just at any point in time, we know exactly what recommendation to send them or what CRM message, 
or what in-app notification and so on, what to recommend them to do next. So they can, we, can, we can get them, we can get more of our customers to be premium customers. Um, there is another use case I wanted to mention to you today that is not necessarily pertaining to revenue directly, but rather indirectly. So uh, with such granular customer segmentation and that I will talk about how we build in a minute, uh, we can also uh, better understand suspicious behavior, potentially fraudulent behavior. So fintechs, are, as you can see here in, in my notes, uh, are, are being targeted by fraudsters. Uh, I think maybe because the idea is they might be less well defended. Um, I read this in the UK finance report that uh, in 2019, there were 94% more cases of fraud or, or scam uh, than 2018. Um, and, and the fraudsters are getting more and more clever, right? So uh, fraud can and needs to be addressed more holistically. We can't just look at card transactions anymore. I won't go into too much detail into our fraud analytics process here, but um, I do want to point out that knowing how a customer uses the app and what customer support tickets they raise and then add to that the usual payments monitoring processes and so on we get a whole new dimension of understanding fraudulent behavior uh, of a simple transaction monitoring so it's a very powerful concept and all this is in a bid to address the ever-growing complexity of fraud money mules money laundering rings of scammers etc none of this is new but it has become a bit more easy to do and uh, it's they're just more dynamic now with the introduction of more digital banks so the good news is it cuts both ways because of the digital bank being uh, effectively it's mobile app is the bank branch uh, and because we have a lot of data about who accesses the bank account uh, and from where and when and how we can create sophisticated automated processes that flag uh, uh, fraudulent behavior and I'm, and I'm kind of truly of the opinion that integrated analytics is the key to solving a lot of financial crime but anyway that aside here's the most important thing i will say today um you can leave after this. Um, the integrated analytics does not work top down. So you have to integrate all the data on the most granular level possible, the micro level, and then aggregate, and then segment, and then otherwise group and go bottom up. So, for example, in a B2C use case, um, we need to bring the basic information about the customer uh, together with their support tickets or their individual transactions and payments, web or mobile app, whatever the product is, how they use it, you know, these usage logs. Um, and features that they use, and then even digital advertising and customer engagement data. And this forms a single customer view, and it is as granular as possible. So typically we do this by pulling all the data from the relevant resources that I mentioned before uh, into a single data source. Uh, we then pick up these relevant pieces, uh, as in the, the piece of data that we need from each source. Um, and in a kind of in an agile way, little by little, we start to integrate them, building up a, a data model uh, using the data modeling technique, by the way, that we call that is called Data Vault 2.0. If, if you haven't come across it, do check it out. It is a really interesting and useful uh, methodology. So it allows us to very flexibly flexibly model the uh, interconnectedness of data. Uh, we then use uh, the data, as in we surface the data from this model to business intelligence tools like Looker, Tableau, uh, and and to our data science processes that ultimately aim to generate the actionable insights I talked about before. So how do APIs help us? Uh, well, most importantly, they help us build robust, consistent data pipelines to do this granular data integration. Um, so I have a simple slide here, and I just want to explain the three kind of main things that, that APIs allow us to do. So at, at the very core of what an API does is um, it gives us secure access to granular data. So this data is often more granular to what is available via third-party SaaS tools reporting interface. Like if you go to Mixpanel or Salesforce or Shopify or Facebook ads or whatever, you will be able to pull some aggregated report um, and maybe you can do, do your job like that. But if you go to the API, you can pull a lot more granular raw data. And this is something that we can use for our data integration process that I detailed uh, before. Uh, secondly, well-designed APIs will give us a robust data schema. So uh, the data will be formatted in the same way, look the same, as long as we ingest from the same API version. Uh, this is hugely important if you want to guarantee a data quality downstream. And uh, so for your analysts and data scientists, always get the same level of, uh, of quality for your data. Uh, and this is kind of the second most important thing I'm going to say today, if you're still here. Uh, the best way to fail a data analytics project, speaking from experience, is to not be paranoid about data quality. Um, but I can maybe talk about this another time. 
And then thirdly, APIs allow us to keep up with the evolution of the third party system at our own pace. So a good API will go through a well-established development lifecycle. They will design it, develop it, test it, deploy it, and in due course, they will retire it. Uh, my background is in data engineering and analytics. And I remember in the not so distant past, uh, five or 10 years ago, maybe, uh, when I was building ETL processes that connected to various internal and external databases directly. And I was completely at their mercy, right? If they change a single field in a table, our entire ETL system breaks down. Or if they added new columns or new tables, then we they might be super useful for us, but we'd never find out because nobody will let us know. It was a really bad process. And now, um, now that we have this uh, much more well-established API release cycle, then every release candidate tells us uh, what will change and we have enough time to prepare. And then in your course, we can kind of move on to the new version of the API. Well, we, we personally don't do this as much anymore. Um, we kind of rely on Fivetran because it takes care of all of this for us. Uh, I don't know how they manage to stay on top of hundreds of APIs and third party data sources, but um, things like schema drift, new fields, um, incremental models and so on, they, they, just, they just handle for us automatically. So I just want to talk a little bit about Fivetran and how we use it. Uh, first, I want to give them a shout. Uh, we're working with a number of data vendors in this space. Uh, and I can honestly say that um, Fivetran has the most advanced product for data engineering automation out there. Uh, so we're using Fivetran wherever we can, uh, as it helps us to eliminate a project phase that traditionally took around three to six months. And this is the phase of building connectors to a bunch of data sources. So before Fivetran, and sometimes when we can't really use Fivetran for various reasons, uh, we have to do this, right? We need to deploy a robust platform um, that will hold our data pipelines and will scale as the data volume and velocity increases. So uh, we choose to do this on Kubernetes. Uh, we then need to deploy some orchestrator that will organize everything for us. Um, this includes things like telling each pipeline when to run, dealing with failure, alerting, and all this other stuff. Um, then each pipeline will consist of some custom code, usually in Python, that connects to an API. Um, and well, ideally, an API, sometimes it has to be a raw data source if there is no API. And the pipeline will then need to handle authentication, extracting data without hitting, hitting various throttling limits, storing then the data, processing it, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a, a huge amount of DevOps involved. So typically, um, for an experienced data team, data engineering team, it takes two to four weeks to develop a new pipeline, then another two to four weeks to test it, validate with business users and so on. And then eventually they would have to spend time maintaining it and you know addressing schema change issues and so on and so forth. So altogether, we need to do about six to 10 weeks of work for just one pipeline. And that's one data source. Then if we have 10, 12, 20 data sources, that's, that's a lot of weeks. And with Fivetron, this is kind of how it, it looks. You just, you have to authenticate it with the various data sources, and then it automatically pulls the data in a really usable, clean schema uh, straight into the data warehouse. It deals with authentication, with the peculiarities of each API, uh, with the maintenance, with the alerting, and so on. And then for those obscure data sources that they don't have a connector to, uh, we tend to use Cloud Functions. So it integrates with Lambda, AWS Lambda, and Google Cloud Function, and, and the Azure equivalent, I forget the name now. Um, and we just need to make sure that the function returns data in a particular format, and Fivetran takes care of the rest, including uh, incremental features, the duplication, and so on. And finally, my favorite thing about it is the DBT integration. So they used to just have simple SQL transformations. So after they pull data from a source, they would um, run some SQL to post-process this data. And now they use DBT. So just quickly, if you're not familiar with DBT, here's a screenshot of what it gives you. So it gives you things like data lineage, documentation, et cetera, et cetera. This is a screenshot of the lineage that it generates for you automatically. This is uh, one of the uh, sophisticated documentation that you can have. So here you can even add things like uh, data governance. So who's responsible for a particular transformation or a particular calculation. And um, it basically just has go on drugs. So I'm just gonna breeze through these because I'm running out of time. But as a summary, this is the four components of the Fivetron data infrastructure. Fivetron pulls the data and ingests it into the data warehouse and also schedules DBT, as in runs it when, when it has to be run. Then you only need a data warehouse um, and then off you go to, well, obviously do the data modeling there. And then BI tools and data science kind of feed off of that. So um, if you want to focus on the real value, uh, for your business, then you should probably look to automate data engineering as much as possible and focus on the analytics and data science. That's maybe the 
third important message I have for you today. Um, and yeah, uh, if you want to check us out, drop drop us a line, Infinite Lambda. We kind of specialize in building these platforms end to end. And lastly, my friends at Fivetran asked me to invite you to the other sessions that they'll be at. Um, I will definitely check them out. And if you want to hear more about their product, uh, join the uh, roundtables. Thank you very much, Nas. Thank you for uh, this presentation. Yeah, the, let's say data science, data engineering is not enough. Uh, uh, so many, many bank and financial institutions are actually actively looking for free hiring talents and everything, but it's never, it's, um, it's quite hard. It's quite hard to do well, right? It's easy to do it badly and really hard to do it, to, to, to do it properly. So one question about, you know, uh, one of the two statements you said is that uh, don't assume the data is clean, right? Uh, don't assume the data is great. And, and there is also a lot of ways on the cultural, cultural side that where financial people are not aware about, you know, uh, so there is assuming the data is clean, uh, not nor normalizing the data, excluding outliers or including outliers, right? Ignoring seasonality, ignoring size of the data set. Uh, uh, there's also some uh, vanity metrics, you know, the fake metrics that actually have no business inside. There is the no collected here syndrome. There is there are many many, uh, or you know, some companies who focus on noise. Right, there are many many ways where actually you can be wrong, uh, uh, right, with uh, with uh, data science and data engineering. So what what would be your advice about like being sure you do it good, you do it well enough to have uh, act actionable insights? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I probably need need another hour to answer it fully, but or maybe more. But um, my my immediate kind of answer is when we when we build the data platform, we kind of segment how we deal with data in, in two phases. So one is a data lake phase, which traditionally is just where you dump all your data, but we kind of take it a step further, and that's the data the data quality layer. So we don't promote data to the data warehouse, i.e., to where it's now able to be consumed until we've built this data quality layer that has a bunch of tests and automated validations around it that are an amalgamation of business rules. So our folks in the, in the business side telling us what the data should look like and technical kind of specifications. So DBT, by the way, is one of the technologies you can use to validate your data. And once you have this data quality layer and everyone agrees that this is what the data should look like, then you kind of, this data vault methodology that I, that I mentioned, it is a way of very flexibly building um, a data integration model. So build a little bit, run it in an agile way, kind of two week sprints is what we tend to do. Build a little bit of the model, try to address one use case. Don't, don't try to boil the ocean, address one use case, make sure that the results make sense. Also wet people's appetite if you're trying to introduce a transformational program, solve a real problem, and then start to add more into your, into your data lake and into your uh, data integration model. I hope yep. that that helps. That helps for an introduction to the one hour, uh, let's say, <laughs> workshop on data science that we're, we'll be glad to invite you for one of these uh, at the next conference. So we are out of time. Thank you very much, Nas. Uh, it was a, a insightful presentation about all the jobs uh, you're doing about uh, monetizing uh, data internally or uh, or externally uh, by having the right, by being able to do the, to make the right decisions. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Nas.